Welcome to the symposium on COVID-19 organized by the Biostatistics Department in the School of Global Public Health at NYU. Uh, this is Yan Feng, an associate professor in the Biostat Department. Uh, in particular, I would like to send a warm welcome to the newly admitted students. So now we have passed the one year mark of the COVID-19 pandemic at New York, at, uh, New York City. So our students, alumni, and faculty have done a lot of excellent research to combat this public health crisis by utilizing various kinds of data and statistical analysis. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, begin our symposium. First, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Josh Epstein, a renowned professor of epidemiology who has made groundbreaking contributions to various areas of ep epidemiology, in particular, uh, Professor Epstein has pioneered the aging-based modeling approach for biomedical and social dynamics and authored quite a few well-regarded books. Um, so he has received many honors and awards, including the uh, NIH Pioneers Award, and also he's a member of the New York Academy of Sciences. Uh, so Josh, are you ready to start the show? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. And yes, welcome to all the new students and present students. And uh, it's great to have you here. Hopefully we'll all be together in person in the fall. Uh, so yes, today I wanted to talk about two COVID-19 projects that we've had underway here at uh, NYU. Uh, one of them, and I, one of them is, a, is called an NYU Catalyst Grant, which uh, Erez and me and Jennifer Crodell from the Courant Institute uh, have been working on. Another is an NSF grant, uh, COVID-19 rapid grant to uh, Josh, Erez, Yang, Rebecca, who I think you've met, who's the chair of biostatistics, Abby Jones, a postdoctoral student here in EPI, Gerardo Chorel, Chowell from Georgia and David Bronyatowski from George Washington. Uh, big collaboration there. So the first of these uh, projects is really about the theory of epidemiology. It tries to advance the theory by introducing behavioral adaptation. Uh, we'll talk about that. And the second project really tries to test that empirically or test something akin to it empirically. So I'll present the theoretical line, the catalyst grant, and then Yang and Eros will present the empirical one. But it's important to say that everyone on these projects has made important contributions to them. And when you, the new students, join a project, we welcome your contributions uh, as well. Okay. So the first part is about this theoretical work that's really an attempt to, you know, to, to, to do behavioral epidemiology. Classical epidemic models, and I'm talking about dynamic models that predict trajectories of the disease. Uh, these really don't include behavioral adaptation. Everyone keeps mixing, the thing keeps spreading, nobody changes their behavior. And it gives a very, very kind of worst case account of what could possibly happen in these epidemics. And it's quite unrealistic in that regard. And it really can't generate multiple waves of epidemics without introducing exogenous forces like seasons or birth rates or other sorts of things. The classical model really doesn't include behavioral adaptation and can't generate waves. And the waves, of course, have been central to COVID-19 in the US and worldwide. And frankly, given the growing hesitancy about vaccines, we may have further waves or premature relaxation of distancing. There are lots of mechanisms for waves and I'll talk about those. But everybody's familiar with these COVID multiple waves uh, at the national scale. They're happening all over the world. Multiple waves have been characteristic of this pandemic. Within the US, uh, there have been very pronounced waves in New Jersey, Connecticut, Florida, Maryland, Arkansas, South Dakota, Kentucky, Arizona, Texas, many other places. And in particular, in the state we are focusing on in our empirical work, New York. Here's the picture there. This is slightly at, this needs to be updated a little bit because we're really entering another wave. But it's all been driven by Metro Manhattan. So point one, uh, multiple waves are characteristic of this pandemic and, and of others. And we need better theory to account for this. And multiple waves 
really don't require new strains. I mean, new strains can produce new outbreaks, but in most of these cases, historically, and even in COVID to date, it really hasn't been new strains. It's been behavioral matters like premature relaxation of distancing, uh, vaccine refusal, other sorts of things. So I wanna show two kind of behavioral narratives that we're trying to capture in the model. And I'll show you the mathematics after talking about this. But one narrative is really about distancing. Forget, forget vaccine for the moment. This narrative is the disease takes off. That makes people afraid of the disease. Because they're afraid, they go into isolation, wear masks, do hygiene, distancing takes over. So contacts go down and that makes new cases go down. But now because the cases have fallen, people stop being afraid of the disease. They stop distancing and wearing masks, their contacts go up and it produces a second wave because contact goes up. So the basic narrative, and we'll talk about this in the empirical uh, end, is basically disease spike produces a fear spike that reduces contacts and cuts new cases. Because the cases are falling, fear falls, contacts go up again, and new cases explode. And this is the mechanism for the 1918 Spanish pandemic, Spanish flu pandemic. Here's those data. And it's fun to look at these things historically. I know we're all quantitative and want to do statistics, but it's also fun to just explore the history of it. So in the US, uh, we had two waves. And here's what happened in Chicago is this blue curve. And you can read in the newspapers from Chicago at the time that uh, as the thing broke out, the instruction was go home and go to bed until you're well, get out of circulation. And that suppressed the disease to the point where the commissioner of health could say, we're practically out of the woods, all bans are off. And he was right, practically out of the woods. But that's not good enough in epidemics because even a few infectives can make the thing blow up. We talk about a single index case for uh, these pandemics. So he didn't have the benefit of our modern theory and made the mistake of relaxing distancing too soon. And you got these multiple waves. And it's really the same story everywhere. And it's the same story in COVID. Uh, Second narrative involves vaccination and cycles of disease promoted by, uh, by this behavioral dynamic. In this model, it's really the balance between fear of disease and fear of the vaccine that makes things, that makes things go. And the details are in our new paper, Coupled Contagion, which we've posted on ArchiveX and is now at the uh, Royal Society interface. But in a nutshell, the story is this. If people are more afraid of the disease than they are of the vaccine, they accept the vaccine. But this can suppress the disease. Now people become less afraid of the disease than the vaccine, and they stop taking the vaccine, and the thing roars back, right? I mean, it's another one of these cycles. You're scared, so you do something that suppresses the disease, but then your fear decays, and you stop doing the smart thing, and the whole thing, you start doing stupid stuff, and the thing comes back. So this is always the narrative in some form or another. Uh, and it's what it's, it's smallpox is a very prime historical example, among many others, measles, even polio is, is resurgent under this sort of mechanism. And the idea is that the rate of vaccine uptake is proportional to the difference between the fear of disease and the fear of vaccine. You'll see it's a little more fancy than that, but that's the idea. And so when they're equal is a tipping point for these dynamics, right? If the fear, if the, if the difference is positive, you're more afraid of disease than vaccine, you take the vaccine. That suppresses the disease. Now the fear of disease is less than the fear of the vaccine. You stop taking the vaccine, but then the thing comes back. And again, while we have lots of statistics and it's always great to do statistics, uh, it's also interesting to look at the history and uh, in her great book, The Speckled Monster, which is all about smallpox, uh, Jennifer Carroll writes, in London, inoculations popularity waxed and waned through the 1730s with the force of the disease. In bad years, people flocked to be inoculated. In lighter years, the practice shrank. Inoculation was a security, the only security to cling to within the terror of an epidemic. In times of good health, however, it looked like a foolish flirtation with danger. And so you get smallpox cycles by this mechanism also. 
All right, so our new model that we produced in this uh, COVID pandemic includes many contagions. There's the contagion of disease, of course, but there are several other contagions. Disease and fear of disease is another contagion. That can be suppressed by vaccine, but there can also be fear of the vaccine. So the model is called coupled contagion, a two fears epidemic model, which tries to get all of these behaviors under one roof. Here are the equations. It's a set of eight nonlinear differential equations. Uh, obviously, I can't go into this in a huge amount of detail. Uh, we're happy, happy to teach this and talk to you about it and discuss our papers. Uh, but the basic idea is that uh, it subsumes the very classical model. In the classical model, susceptibles, infectives, and removes are the only categories. And people flow from the susceptible to the infected pool by this term alone with no fear. If you reduce all this fear, anything with an F in, you just have infectives bumping into susceptibles, they transmit with probability beta, and bam, they go into the infected pool, and then they're removed at a constant rate that you see here in the removed area. So it's S by this term into I, and then removed at this rate into R. That's the classical model. And you can see that it doesn't include any of this fear apparatus. And here is the, uh, this last term equation eight is where we have this difference. The, di the notation is a little different, but you see that what's really driving it is the fear of disease minus the fear of vaccine. All right, so let's show you a couple of these scenarios where you get multiple waves from this model. Uh, one of them is where there's contagious fear decay. Uh, which controls these second waves. And the second waves can be bigger than the first waves, which is also interesting. But here, if fear decays rapidly, then people quickly come out of the basement and they come out too soon and you get a second wave. And the model is very nice in that it has a classical fear decay based on the neuroscience of fear, but also a contagious fear decay because you're bumping into people who are no longer afraid. So it can amplify the decay of fear and produce these very interesting waves, including second waves that are bigger than the first ones. Uh, right now, today, we have this situation. There are adverse reactions to the J&J &J vaccine, and they've led to the suspension of vaccinations. Even rare adverse events can lead to contagions of vaccine fear and vaccine refusal. And these can also, and may yet, here in the United States, produce subsequent waves. Here's what our model says about that. If we have high adverse event rates or highly salient adverse events might be a better way to, to put it, then people abandon the vaccine and you can get another second wave from vaccine refusal. This is a distinct possibility here and now. And uh, it's another one of these dynamics that our model at least captures in a qualitative way. And, you know, uh, I say qualitative because we want, we're now engaged in empirical work to try to test this model and see if uh, some aspects of it actually stand up to empirical challenge. Uh, but it illustrates a nice larger point about, about science, and that is that theory can precede data. Science doesn't always start with data. Sometimes it starts with a theory, and the theory suggests what data to collect in the first place. And those data may not be available. They may require new types of data. And to test these behavioral models does require novel data on fear, on mobility, and other factors that Yang and Erez will now discuss, and uh, also the statistical analysis of all of that. All right, so that's uh, part one. And I now turn it over to my dear colleagues, Erez and uh, Yang. Okay. I would say uh, if you if you were that uh, a credit, um, the empirical part that we're going to show you now, uh, beside the group that uh, we mentioned, we include also uh, uh, David Born mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Uh, um, um, also Mark Dreze for John Hopkins, uh, Abby Jones, oh. uh, uh, Dan Ting Lee, uh, another student. And and and, and Rebecca, Rebecca, Rebecca Bitensky. Um, so there are many many people around it. So we didn't uh, write all their names, but uh, that's uh, well. It, we did include all their names in yes, the, in the description of the project. Yes, so I want, definitely. I want, I want to, 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 of to, to, course. More complete. 
Uh, 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 yeah, would you sh uh, share the screen or, sh or should I? Uh, yeah, I, I can do it. Okay. Okay. Um. Mm. So maybe we can work. As, I think this presentation, which is more like uh, we're going to show results. So I think uh, me and Yang can work together with showing you stuff because unlike the previous uh, uh, presentation, this is more like, uh, this is the part that we actually did not finish yet. It's actually a work in progress. So we're going to show you now, uh, not only uh, what we achieved, but also what we did not achieve in a way that what we are still doing. So uh, the, 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 actual, the actual analysis was done by Yang. So whenever we're going to see something empirical, really he's going to want to can explain more than me. So, because he knows what was done, but uh, but, uh, but I I will, I will just, just start to maybe connect the two to, to the two pieces that we show. Uh, uh, just showed us a, a theoretical model, uh, which is very this, important. Sorry, does this work? Yes, no, excellent. excellent. Okay. Thank you. So you know you know theoretical models are very important because the, the first thing they can show that we, we can put our, our knowledge. You know, knowledge is not only empirical. Knowledge uh, empirically means that it's measured data. It's actually experience. It's also accumulation of, 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 of uh, information from different studies, you know? And, and you can put them into models, even if you don't have numbers. So this is what we did in the first part. We took all the uh, a theory we have about infectious diseases and added other mechanisms which are uh, reasonable. And we and we created these structures, which uh, we can we can learn mm -hmm. about dif dif different processes. Uh, however, uh, of course, the, uh, there's this limitation to these models in a way that uh, we we have to confront them with reality in some aspect, you know. And this is more like the second part. We are trying to to see if the re relationships that we we speculate in the models we can observe them. Some of, them, some of the mechanisms that we talked about before, the equations, are quite self-evident, or at least they are not completely wrong in a way that they are based on a lot of research. So it's not about saying that, you know, uh, if, if, if people really don't like to get, get it's, un, it's unlikely to say that if people don't like to get vaccinated, they get vaccinated. Usually they, they would we do it less, you know? So uh, if people are afraid of the disease, they would not use masks. Probably they would use, use more masks, you know, unless there's other factors. So there's a lot of, of reasonable assumptions here, which are not, cannot be completely rejected. Uh, however, we also need to go to data. And in here, uh, how to measure this? Because, because in this part, we're not going to use the equations directly. We can, but we decide to go to a statistical model. Uh, why? because statistical models actually are much more uh, flexible in a way. You know, the, these models don't have really, uh, they, they are very, uh, the only theory which is inside statistical models are theorems. They're actually just about relationship to the data. There's not much mechanisms usually be, be in, inside these models. So they're very, very flexible and they can detect any association. This is why we, we, are, we are abandoning for a moment, the equations, the differential equation, and go to regressions. You know, regressions are very, very flexible. You know, parameters you you can, you can mold them for many, many uh, relationships. So we need a conceptual framework that we and Yang and and George and everybody thought about. So, so this is the simplest conceptual framework we can think about, and it's incomplete, by the way. Let's look at it. Consistent with with, with Josh uh, narrative, we said people are afraid of afraid of uh, people have some fear. It comes probably from maybe many things, but maybe because of of COVID, fear reduces mobility or it is influenced with mobility. Mobility influences contact contact rates, so it, it influences uh, COVID cases. And then COVID cases influence public fear again. And also there's a government response that like the government see COVID cases and it can actually have some kind of regulation. Like for example, you have, you have to wear a mask, you're closing restaurants, 
and, and again, it's, it's reducing mobility. Now look at this structure and it's very clear that we're not trying to show a complete picture here. For example, public fear create mobility, mobility create criticism, but public fear also create uh, uh, other behaviors, not only mobility. People can actually wash their hands, they can put masks. So there's other factors which are, which are actually, we are, not, we are not putting right now. So of course, public fear create uh, in general, protective behaviors, protective behavior create COVID cases. But now we said, no, forget about protected behaviors, let's do only mobility. So, so you see that it's, it's actually an incomplete model. And as, as such, we cannot expect to be extremely good because we're actually putting just a sample of variables and, and a lot of other variables and, co, uh, and covariates. And maybe this confounding here that we are not controlling at this point. So. It's a very, very, uh, but, but the idea is to, 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 to create a picture of what, how do we think the causation goes by. Okay, so let's together look at data that we have and, and uh, or at least, uh, can you move to the next slide, Yang, please? So what the variables can we collect? Because we need to know something about these properties. So some of them are easy, cases. It's not easy, but it's, it's available, you know? Like we have, we have the day number of cases. Of course, it's reported cases. It's not all the cases. It's a classic problem in epidemiology. However, you know, in statistics, we always work with samples anyhow, you know? <laughs> so it's a sample of cases. And usually uh, they are a good indicator of how many cases we have. And maybe they are not all the cases, but actually we don't care that much because for our purposes, we only care about uh, the relative frequency, you know? So, that, so if it's a random sample uh, or if, uh, and if the reporting is always the same, I'm cool. Because there are some theories which protect me, you know, uh, that as long as it's proportional, I'm good. Uh, fear, fear is an issue. How do you measure fear? So you, you, of course, there are many, many ways uh, we can go and do, and do for example, uh, 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 surveys and ask people how they feel. It's very, very good because there are really good ways to measure fear. However, it's very expensive. You can't do it every day. So we took a passive approach, not an active approach. And the passive approach is simply to use Twitter. So we take a tweet, a Twitter data and Twitter actually, which are, which are categorized which are, uh, to include COVID-19 relevant content. And then we use machine learning methods simply to, to measure the in intensity of the fear. So it's a classifier that we are using. So it's a, we're using, let's say we're using, if we use the, we're using one of the best classifier available. And this classifier is, classifier is not that good. In a way that even the state of the art uh, so for example, uh, this classifier was actually, it, it, it supervised learning. So it means that there was a uh, raters, real raters, which actually uh, rated the fear level of tweets. And then the machine tried to imitate the raters uh, rate. So the first thing is the raters themselves tend to be uh, inconsistent. So it means that uh, the reliability of raters is not that high. So Tommy uh, say that this is a five, and, and Angela said it's, it's a two. So there's some inter-reliability problems in this, in, in, rater, in human raters. And also there's a problem that the machine doesn't catch very well the, the, the human raters. So in essence, about 60%, the, 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 the classifier can explain 60%, I think, of the human raters, okay? 60% can explain, 40% will remain random. So it's not perfect, but it includes information, so it's useful. Uh, mobility, uh, mobility by, by, by the way, uh, the fear was done by, done by David and, uh, uh, and mobility was done by um, Mark Dredzi group. And mobility, is, it's again based on social media, Twitter. So, you know, some Twitter Twitters have a, a geolocation. So what they do, they actually take a, a person, they calculate the centroid of, of his locations the center is like the mean coordinate. They call it his home. And then they calculate the standard deviation of the location. So it's a called standard, standard distance. It says 
uh, how much do I move around my center of mass? Okay, so it's a center. It's like, like the average distance so, uh, it, that I move. And there's also a governmental response index, which is a, a, a collection of indices, which actually uh, take into account a lot of uh, policies uh, and, and intervention made by governments. It's actually a data set which is comparable for many, many countries. So you can do it uh, uh, actually for, for all many countries in the world. So it's, so it's comparable. And actually, I don't remember actually who did it. Uh, Abby, do you remember who, who, who created this, uh, this data? It's from a group at Oxford, Oxford. but so it's publicly smart. available. Ah, yes, so Oxford are smart, it's a good word. Oxford, you know, it sounds good. And we know it's actually very, very reasonable data because it's a uh, very detailed and, and it's a construct of, it's an index, but it includes many, 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 uh, uh, like school closure, mask wearing. So it's very, it's, it's very, very, very detailed. So now that we know something about what we are measuring, let's try to see uh, how the data looks like. So let's see what we have here. So let's start, uh, this is a temporal graph. And uh, let's look at the COVID cases. It's, this is the red, the red curve. And you can see, if you look at the red, that it's, uh, it's what we know. We had we we two waves. You see uh, one wave, it was, uh, it was around April, another one around January. Uh, the second wave was larger than the first, just like Josh showed us, after it's consistent with uh, the same behavior. And uh, so we, we had a, a first wave, then we had a, a, a time of uh, relaxation, nothing much happened, and then a second wave occurred. By the way, all these variables are standardized. So they have a mean of zero and side division of one. Okay, just to make them comparable because they have different units. Now, uh, let's say, let's, uh, so this is the, the red curve. And let, let's look at the, uh, at the purple curve for a moment, the mobility. So what happened in the mobility? Notice that mobility actually goes down until April, and then it starts to go up again. So let's go down sharply and then go up again. So why is it going down? Probably because we have an epidemic and uh, people are afraid. And also government simply closed, simply had intervention which uh, gathered people not to, not, not to move uh, that much. So notice that we are seeing that uh, COVID cases go up and mobility go down. Now, um, this is actually an interesting behavior because uh, if we would take only these two variables, mobility and COVID cases, without any other factors, we would expect, of course, it, at least in a very, very basic thinking, that if uh, mobility goes down, COVID cases should always go down, you know? But it's incorrect to say this way because it's not that simple. Because the first thing, we have, we have an epidemic going up here. There's a lot of fuel. It's a, it's a forest which is burning. The fact that people, the fact that the, 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 the fire engine coming and put water, doesn't mean that the fire goes, is decreasing, you know? So if there's a fire, it's expanding and, and the fire people come to treat the, the fire, that means that they, that they are going to immediately reduce the fire. You know, it takes some time. So this is what we see here. We see the mobility goes down. It's probably reducing the rate of change. It's probably curving down the growth, but it's not curving down the absolute number. So, so this is why I want to, say, to tell you why it's different than the theory that Josh said, because we, we, we are measuring here the cases. Probably the mobility curved down the growth, okay? Now, uh, what else do we see? We see fear. The fear is, the, is the, actually the um, green curve. So we see that fear again goes down as, uh, as COVID cases uh, go up. Again, we have a, a, another, probably a, a similar story in a way that people were very, very afraid at the beginning of the, of the epidemic because it was new and new information. You know, it's like, wow, there's something new. It's very salient, you know. After a while, you know, you get used to it and they're relaxing. 
So you see, it's a very complicated story here. Notice something interesting about mobility, by the way. Mobility is, again, is the purple curve. Notice that mobility is, is, is at a minimum when maybe COVID is at, at a maximum. So after, so notice that after the maximum, when people now actually uh, notice that we have now a decrease in the, number, in the incidence, uh, then mobility actually started to grow again. So uh, you, 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 you see that there's some relaxation and relationship between the curves, but they are not so easy to represent. Now, fear, look at fear for a moment. I know it's very qualitative, but it's good to look at that a little bit. I evolved it a bit. Let's look at the fear again. Fear goes down, and then it, it gets into, in, into a behavior which is very erratic, up and down, up and down, you see, for a while, after, after from July, from July. So you can see that after a while, fear becomes very, very erratic, up and down, up and down. And it's not clear if it's, if it's a real signal or maybe it's simply random noise. And as you can also can see, we have also the GRI, the, the Government Response Index, which goes up very, very fast, and then it's quite stable. So government took action and then not much happened. So you can see it's a very complicated pictures and the regressions are going to represent these pictures. So uh, Jan, can you go to the next? Uh, the next uh... So this is, the, this is the different regressions that we are going to, uh, to show. And you can see that we, we, we took the casual diagram and cut it in the different places. So we have using cases to predict fear, fear to predict mobility, fear in government to predict mobility. So different, different parts of the diagram, uh, we create regressions and it's, a, it's incomplete. And you're going also to see that the regression themselves are, are not, they're not controlled for all the variables that we care about. So it's a very like uh, preliminary regressions that really describe uh, the data we show you. Uh, another thing to say is if you notice mobility data was incomplete. If you notice the, 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 the magenta, uh, not magenta, the, the purple curve was incomplete. Uh, and uh, so it's going to influence our results. Now we have the complete data, so we, we, but we can't show it to you today. So Yang, can, can you, can you can I, Yang, can I explain the, the method, the regression, I think? And then we can, you, you can show us, together we can show the results. Great. Uh, yeah, so I apologize that I, I forgot to introduce Professor Henna. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm here. <laughs> So as you, as everyone can see that uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Hanna is a real expert in this uh, epidemiology and also he works on, in addition to aging-based modeling, he's also uh, works a lot on the uh, geoinformatics and also spatial analysis and a lot of other uh, research uh, interests. So, um, so Thank you. Um, yeah, so, sorry about that. Yeah, because it's like a joint presentation. So uh, yeah, we are together. It's like a group. Okay. Uh, so let me just introduce like the uh, details of the regression analysis we do. Um, so the reason why uh, I want to show this to everyone is that uh, for those uh, that are current students or like uh, uh, like new students um, that you are considering. Uh, so all the methodology we used uh, here for now is uh, like you can do it after taking the linear regression course. So it's like, uh, for those of you that, so everything it's like within reach for you, like after a year of uh, study here, you will be able to do everything I'm doing here. Okay. Um, so, so I'm gonna introduce the methodology. So you can see here, we are, we are having six different uh, kind of regression questions we're trying to solve. And this is by no means, uh, let's say, the optimal way to make this prediction. So the, the, the reason why we're making these predictions is we want to see the potential. So it's kind of like we want to test our hypothesis of those uh, causal inferences, like uh, the relationships between cases and fear and mobility and the government's response index. And that's, I want to study their relationships. That's all we want to do. And of course, you know, uh, linear regression, um, it's not always, it's not, of course, not the true model, 
but it is a way to let us get a first look of the relationship of different variables uh, and about their uh, whether they are positive related or negative related. Um, so let me explain it. Uh, so first of all, I want to um, uh, look at the data. So I want to uh, show you that. So this data, we, what we did was we first do a seven day moving average uh, when we plot everything. And also this is true for all the analysis. The reason why we take a seven day moving average is because uh, there is this uh, weekend effect many and also taking this moving average will make the data much more smooth and uh, it will make uh, basically reduce the noise in our data. Okay, uh, just something to keep in mind. Um, so the methodology we used is uh, so-called best subset selection using lagged variables. So uh, we know that this, we are dealing with a time series. Uh, so they are like in four time series in total. So the idea is that we want to use the lagged predictors up to seven days. So this is the first uh, step that is uh, we're going to in include all the lagged. So basically, we want to predict something, what will happen tomorrow, right? So what we have is everything that has happened until today. Uh, so let's say for the first example, okay, is you want to predict uh, the fear for tomorrow, okay? So the, the measure of fear for tomorrow, what we'll be using in our prediction model is the cases for the past seven days, basically today's case and yesterday's case and up to a week's a week before today's case. Okay, so uh, and that is true for all the regression problems we are trying to solve. For example, the third one, uh, we're using fear and the government research uh, response index to predict mobility. That is, we're going to use uh, 14 variables uh, for fear and the government response index uh, for the seven day lags. Okay, so there are 14 potential predictors constructed for the third regression. Okay. Uh, so that is um, the idea of, uh, so we never want to do a prediction or using regression. So we want to identify the potential predictors, right? Okay, so that is how we construct the potential predictors. And then we use the best subset selection method to exhaust all the possibilities. So it's, it's kind of like if you have seven variables, uh, if you want to calculate all the possible uh, submodels, there are about like 128 possible models, right? So there are a lot of possibilities. And if there are like uh, uh, 14 variables, there are like two to the power of 14 possible models. And we're gonna look at each of the possible model, and then we're gonna compare their AIC value. So we know the AIC value is a very famous uh, model selection criteria uh, that is widely used in uh, for model selection that is used for comparing different models. And we know the AIC criteria is usually gives us the best uh, prediction performance. So we're going to take that as our measure, okay, to compare different uh, models, okay? Uh, so next I'm going to present what happens for each regression we're looking at. Okay, so the first example uh, we investigate is using cases to predict fear, okay? Uh, so this is, uh, we did all the analysis using R, and this is uh, if you if you have used a linear regression LM function in R, you would be familiar with this output. OK, uh, so this is the final regression model we selected. And you can see here the name here means the lag of the corresponding variable for case dot one means this is the uh, number of new cases for the previous day, which means the first lag. And case dot seven means uh, the seven day lag of cases. Okay? And we can see that we have the uh, parameter estimates, the standard error of them and also the p-value for each coefficient. Uh, and as you can see, for this model, uh, we have R square of well, 0.6, uh, which is not a bad uh, R square. Um, um, but you can see there is something interesting in this uh, coefficients that, uh, so we select two predictors, and one with a positive um, coefficient, the other with a negative coefficient. So um, as Aris was uh, explaining, right? So this is a kind of a tricky relationship between cases and fear. And there could be um, a lot of things going on with causing people's fear. So, the, uh, so you can see, uh, ideally, I think from our theory, uh, the cases would cause fear, right? So, so that if cases uh, rises, then our fear will rise, right? So we, because we are afraid of these uh, new cases. So, uh, so the case dot one, which means this is a positive coefficient would be more aligned with our 
intuition about this uh, relationship, but we also see a negative uh, case coefficient. Uh, so this is perhaps, so there are like different reasons to explain. I think from uh, just from a modeling perspective, uh, if you're familiar with linear regression models, this could also be uh, something called uh, this, uh, because of the correlation between these two predictors, because we know that the case is rises and falls this is a continuous time series so there is a actually a high correlation between these two coefficients um, and this is also related to the so-called multicollinearity problem among coefficients so that we see this negative coefficient this does not mean uh they are negatively correlated actually uh, to begin with okay but but nevertheless they are it's complicated okay also it's interesting uh, it's also interesting yeah. that uh, you know it's very hard to know how stable it is if you do a different models. Because notice it's only it's a very, very simple regression. But at least let's say that we believe this model. Let's say if we assume it's correct, maybe it's not. So you can see that at least in the short term, like a day before, there's a positive uh, association, which right. makes sense. So don't, don't forget, we have to also to assume like, how what is the memory of people? Do people are afraid of what happened a week ago or are they afraid of what happened a day ago? And maybe, maybe, maybe uh, the positive uh, one day leg makes sense in this case. Uh, so this, if we are very, very hopeful that this model is actually well specified, but it might, me, it might be missing variables, of course. Look, it's very simple regression. Right, okay, thanks. Okay, so the next, um... Uh, yeah, this next regression we study is to using fear to predict mobility. Uh, and you can see here, we also include a date, which is uh, because we are, we're using a time series. So using including a date would kind of help us to uh, get a better fit because this, uh, there's a trend um, depending on time, right? Okay. So um, as in last regression, so we also did this best subset selection. And this time you only select one term for the fear, which is the seven day lag uh, with this particular coefficient 0.39, which is, we can see all the coefficients are extremely significant, uh, which means it indeed make a, a big impact in this prediction model. And you can see this time the R squares is much slower, it's much lower, so it means that uh, actually the mobility is not that easy to predict, okay? Not easy to predict how people move. And uh, uh, I think uh, Aris also explained this um, kind of a disagreement with what our intuition at the beginning about uh, how the mobility uh, changes with regarding the fear. So it's not so it's not an easy story, I think, behind this relationship. Okay. And also, yeah. and also mobility. Don't forget, uh, people, that mobility also a function of the GI. And even other regression, I think, right. actually, the government also influences mobility. So it's a complicated story, like uh, like uh, Yang said. And and Abby Jones made the very nice observation that the way we're measuring mobility, it may be not fine enough to capture mobility within neighborhoods where lots of the spreading actually occurs. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah thanks. Okay, yeah, so the next one, as you can see, uh, now we are gonna add more information. This time we add this government response index and you can see that now the regression model is much more complicated and you can see the R square is pretty high, it's like 0.95. So this is just because uh, so apparently we have this uh, government response index. It's pretty significant uh, in terms of uh, capturing how the mobility changes. Uh, so this is also intuitive, like how people move would uh, be influenced a lot by the regulations about how uh, the rules, right, of the uh, of the government. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, this is uh, the third relationship about prediction mobility. So next, let's. Uh, take a, another look about using, so this is like just to com compare the case that if we have a lagged version of the mobility to predict mobility with the fear. So this is, I, I think I didn't talk about this before, that is uh, usually in time series analysis, we would use the lagged version. So for example, autoregressive model uh, for time series model, that is, we, we think that the lag version of the time series itself is a good indicator, a uh, good predictor for the future uh, values, right? So the reason why we didn't do that for our regression is that we want to, we did it on purpose. That is, uh, we want to say 
uh, we want to see like what kind of predictability we have uh, without using the lag version of the of the variable itself. Okay, so but this this particular regression is kind of like a contrast of uh, like say if you want to use the lag mobility um, to predict itself, like how much better it can do, right? So how much better it can do? I can see that indeed you've got a better uh, R square, which is like a nearly perfect 0 0.9 or 0.99, right? Almost. Okay, um, so and you can see. Of course, you 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 have the mobility dot one, mobility dot two, which is the lag one day and two day lags, uh, significant, right? So this is without um, uh, within our expectation, uh, but nevertheless, you can see that uh, without using the lag version of mobility, we also get a very high R squared. So it means that uh, somehow people's movement can be captured quite well by using the fear and the government response index. Okay, so that this is pretty, uh, I think this is pretty interesting finding that is uh, we can somehow predict people's movement very accurately just by using the fear and the government resp response index. Okay, um, so the next one is to use fee, sorry, to use mobility to predict cases. Okay, uh, so that is another uh, like arrow in our like causal kind of relationships uh so which is to to see how we can capture the cases using just mobility data uh, and you can see here we have a pretty again we have a high r square which is pretty uh, good means meaning that we could predict it very well using the date and the mobility dot two which means the lag two uh two days lag of mobility and you can see again this is there's a negative sign uh, which may be a little bit counterintuitive, right? So as Eris uh, was mentioning about this uh, relationship, uh, so maybe we, want, we don't want to read too much about this mobility. And uh, I think in the immediate future, we will uh, try to maybe get another, perhaps a more accurate uh, measure for the mobility quantity. Yeah, to, to add, like I said yeah. before, this is a yeah. very, very simple regression. We should. We, what can happen here very clearly is that uh, mobility, is, mobility and cases are both influenced by other factors. So mobility is going down because, because for some reason, and also, also cases, and it looks like they are uh, 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 negatively related, right. probably. So, right. so we are missing, it's a confounding of some kind which is include, included here, or, or, some, or, or, or the number of, don't, don't forget the number of cases we have today is influenced by how many people are infected in the system. So there's a lot of complication that we need to, you know, so it's, so the fact that it's negative is not wrong in a way that uh, it's simply not, not, not controlled very well, probably, and, but it's predictive. So we know that even though it's not, uh, it, it contains information, I think. So it's also quite uh, a nice result anyhow. Great, thanks. Okay, so next one is, you can see that now if we want to add this lag cases into the picture, okay? So you can see now we get a nearly perfect capturing. So if, if you have this, so this is to reflect like, like this is a uh, kind of a well-behaved time series because uh, uh, if, you, if you add this lag of the cases itself, you get a nearly perfect recovery. But uh, again, added the uh, mobility information. Okay, uh, so uh, because there are so many coefficients, I'm gonna not gonna explain that. Uh, I guess not too much to read in, into the details here. Okay, uh, so yeah, th so that's uh, some kind of uh, preliminary analysis we did with the data we have. Uh, so as Iris mentioned, uh, so um, it's still ongoing project. And what we are currently doing is we're going to uh, get the mobility, analyze the new mobility data we, we just received for uh, after July uh, 2020. And then, so we are very interested to see like how the, uh, the relationship, how it, how it moves with it to the second wave, like right? how, how the second wave affects this mobility and, uh, um, and maybe we'll get a more complete picture um, like in the near future, yeah. Um, so, Eris, you want to add something before we yes. finish? Yes, so a few, a few words. You, you can see here that we have a conceptual, con you, have, you, have, you, have you have a theoretical model, which is grounded by other models, which were already 
let's say, validated, but it's still theoretical. Uh, we have a theoretical a conceptual frame of how to make, how to a conceptual statistical model. And then when we go to the data, we do discover new things in a way that we see that uh, you know, we, we need more variables, we, we have to control better. Sometimes the sign of the regression is not the way we saw this it's going to be. And then we see, okay, the data tells us why it happens. Because before we saw the data, we were sure that the signs would be just the way we speculate them in the differential equations. However, in the differential equations, we have a closed system in which there's only like six variables interacting. So they are not confounding. And there are no, uh, there, there are no complicated relationships which exist in reality. So it's very nice for this project to bridge the two, to bridge the two and find a way to correct the regressions and, and have estimates which are, which are let's say, uh, controlled for. So, this, so it's very nice to say that how much you can actually learn from doing theoretical uh, models, but how much the data can correct your understanding and gives you more appreciation of the complexities that exist in reality, that actually many, many of the signals are, you know, confounded together. And the trick is to find a way to, you know, to simplify the regression and then probably, hopefully, to find the correct signs. Or, it, or maybe to reject part of your- and Maybe to reject it, yeah. Yes. Okay. And as a f further other point is that the whole issue of what, how do you measure these things is a very fundamental issue. You know, how do you measure fear? How do you measure mobility? What, what is very, very local? Is it long range mobility? It, it, it just drives you into many fascinating questions. Before we go to the questions, I just wanted to say, you know, Yang was nice enough to introduce us, but nobody introduced him. So I wanted to just say, he is one of our real stars and, uh, He's working at the very forefront of uh, biostatistics, introducing machine learning, high dimensional analysis, network models. He's published in, in very, very prestigious journals, Annals of Statistics, Science Advances. And he's clearly very, very widely renowned as one of the real, already a star, but rising superstars of our field. So we're thrilled to have him. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so any questions from Anyone for us, like your comments? Or One final point, and it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no questions. Um, okay, so maybe, maybe, how about we take uh, three minutes short break. Um, so we'll come back at 11. And then uh, so it's the show of our students. Great. Okay. okay. So cool. Let's take a three minute break. Zoom record. Okay, hi, everyone. So welcome back. Um, uh, so next, um, we're going to have six wonderful students of ours or alumni. Uh, so our first talk is uh, by Caroline uh, Winskill. She's going to talk about time to negative COVID-19 test using pseudo observations. So please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fang. Um, hi, everyone. I uh, graduated from last year. And I'm happy to share some work that I did with Dr. Batansky last summer in conjunction with uh, some physicians at NYU Langone who collected the data for us to analyze. And so last summer, a few months into the pandemic, uh, repeat COVID testing was not well characterized and was not incorporated um, into clinical decision making, which is really important uh, from the perspective of uh, the doctors and other providers who were treating the patients. So with the data set, we had two main aims. The first one was to examine factors um, affecting time to negative test. And the second one was to determine if your current COVID-19 status affects time to hospital discharge 
or time to in hospital death. And because of time, I'm only going to be focusing on the first aim today. And so our data set had 142 hospitalized patients at NYU Langone who first tested positive for COVID uh, between March 11th and April 30th of last year, who had repeat testing up until June 20th. And we looked at many different covariates. So for our fixed covariates, uh, we looked at age, gender, race, BMI, as well as uh, a lot of comorbidities and laboratory biomarkers that were measured at admission. And for our time varying covariates, uh, we looked at the same biomarkers that were measured at different times during follow-up, um, follow-up meaning during their hospital stay, um, as well as using their dates of testing and uh, intubation and treatment with drugs such as steroids or tocilizumab as time bearing covariates. So our event of interest was the time to first confirm negative COVID-19 test. So this is a survival analysis. And we treated this as an interval censored event because um, the actual time that a person became COVID-19 negative didn't happen the day they tested negative, but some observe, unobserved time between the date of their last positive test and their last and their first negative test, I'm sorry. Um, but there's also co uh, competing risk due to health and discharge. So um, people that, <clears throat> that were still COVID-19 positive at the time that they died or were discharged, um, meaning that we couldn't observe them anymore for our data set, this <clears throat> prevented observation of um, COVID-19. So our goal was to fit Cox models that accounted for these features. However, um, there is no readily available software, at least in R, which I did for my analysis to analyze interval censored events with time varying covariates. So uh, Dr. Patansky and I uh, proposed to use pseudo observations, which I'll explain more in the next few slides. Um, this is a method that can remove the censoring so that standard statistical models can be applied. And there's a lot of literature on using pseudo observations in survival analysis, especially for right sensor data and a little bit for interval sensor data. Um, to our knowledge, there is no literature previously on using pseudo observations to analyze time bearing covariates, which was really important for the covariates on our data set, but I'll show how we applied the method um, in our analysis. So what are pseudo observations? So really quickly, um, it's calculated by the, the equation that you see above and it's calculated for each person in your data set. And what the pseudo observation represents is their contribution to the estimator. And the estimator can be different statistics. So for example, um, if your estimator, which is represented by the theta is a sample mean, um, the way that the math works out here, um, this pseudo observation for this person is what their data point was used for the sample mean. And um, as it applies to survival data, estimators that have been used in this calculation of pseudo observations inc include the Kaplan Meier estimator and the cumulative incidence function. And I apologize in advance if I'm going through the material very fast. Um, so for pseudo observations and survival data, you can calculate them at multiple time points. So um, you can estimate what someone's contribution is to the survival function at different time points. And prior research recommends that you, you use five to 10 time points that are equally spaced on the event scale. And by using the survival, survival function as your theta um, to calculate the pseudo observations, they can be used as outcome variables and analyzed in a generalized linear model um, using generalized uh, estimating equations to approximate the Cox model as you see here. And the coefficients from this GEE model of pseudo observations are um, equiv equivalent to log hazard ratios. However, there is an issue when you try to um, analyze this 
a form of the Cox model that I just showed here um, when your covariate is time varying. Um, so our solution to that was instead of using the survival function as the theta, we used the log hazard to calculate the pseudo observation. So we could fit uh, this model um, with your covariate, which is represented by T by Z as a time varying covariate. And because you have multiple pseudo observations at different time points calculated for each person, you can regress the value of the time varying covariate that corresponds to the time point at which the pseudo observation is calculated at um, in this generalized linear model to estimate the effect of this covariate. So how did we apply pseudo observations to the data set? So uh, to estimate the hazard, um, and we're estimate, estimating the baseline hazard function, um, we used this package in R called smooth hazard that accounted for the interval censoring and the competing risks that we talked about before. And we chose to calculate five pseudo observations for each person at days 10 to 50, as you see here. Uh, but because of how this calculation works, um, patients that had an event or censoring before the first time point that we used for our pseudo observation um, were excluded from the analysis because after they have their event or are censored, they no longer contribute to the hazard estimation. So um, in analyzing time to negative tests, instead of 142 patients, there were 134. Uh, we found that using this process, uh, we couldn't fit models for some of the covariates um, due to sparsity events in some covariate categories. And here is an overview of our sample. Um, most people were older, half of them you can see were 65 years or older. Um, most were overweight or obese. The most prevalent comorbidity was hypertension. And a small number of people that I wanna point out um, had cancer, 13% uh, or lung disease, um, almost 8%. Uh, for our event of interest, half the people had a confirmed negative COVID-19 test. And in terms of the competing risks that I talked about, um, at the time of discharge, a lot of people, 60% were discharged um, almost a third had died in the hospital and a small number were still in a hospital under observation at the time of data collection. And so here are our main results, uh, the unit variant models using the regression of the pseudo observations. And we found um, that uh, cancer, well, a p-value of 0.06, but lung disease was statistically significant and indicating that uh, these covariates were associated with the time, a shorter time to negative COVID-19 tests, which is counterintuitive. It's not the direction that you would expect. And um, we don't know how to really explain this other than um, the sample size, or there could be some other confounding. Um, and like I mentioned before, there were a really small number of people that had cancer or lung disease. Um, but you can also see that although not statistically significant, um, females were more likely to test negative for COVID-19 sooner. And um, what you see on the, the right are the time varying covariates. And um, yeah, I'll, big overview that I'll just let you guys see really quickly. And then here uh, is our multiple regression model, which we uh, selected using a hybrid stepwise approach uh, using a p-value of 0.15. And so according to our multiple regression model, a uh, higher D-dimer was associated with a greater, ch greater chance for negative COVID-19 tests once you adjusted for these other biomarkers, um, which include CRP, AST, and ferritin. And to summarize what we found from our analysis, uh, we did find some associations with negative COVID-19 tests, which um, 
if confirmed, could be used to manage patients in the hospital. Uh, speaking retroactively for when uh, there were more patients being treated, but also now. Uh, like I talked about before, we did find some issues with estimation of sparsity of events. And this data set actually served as a source of motivation for Dr. Patansky and I to look further into the properties of pseudo observations using the log hazard function. And hopefully uh, we can share the results of that further research in the near future. And so thank you very much. And if there's time, I'll take any questions. Great, thanks. Uh, very good, very good. I, I will yeah. start. Um, but I have two questions. One of them is more like empirical. Uh, do you do you remember what was it was the average time to event, like medium time to event, how much time it takes to get a negative? Uh, I, know, I, know it's, I know it's not in the regression. You, you yeah. showed us right. We did you, look at it. Uh, I, know, I, know. Okay. I don't have that off the top of my head. I know, head. you showed us right, so you don't have the survival curve. Yeah, okay. but um, we did pick those time points from day 10 at day uh, 50. Okay, and from so what I remember, I think the maximum follow-up time or event time in our data set was around 60 or 70. Okay. Um, which is due to the observation period of like, because we were looking at people from March to June. Okay, so it's about weeks. Okay, that's interesting. And, and so it's very interesting that uh, you didn't have any way to, uh, way to do uh, uh, censorship in, on an interval. So, because I, I, I'm not really well in it, but is it because there is no, um, there is no method which are, which are available in R or Stata or because the, the method exists, but there's no implementation of them. Like someone did a model, uh, there's, or it's more about there's no theoretical model. Or... There is a theoretical model, but there's just no easy way ah, to implement. do the coding for it. I see. Okay, interesting. I, mean, I didn't know that. Hi, I'll, I'll just I'll just jump in and I mean there probably is some implementation like for a single binary time varying covariate but nothing that we could find with multiple continuous uh, time varying covariates. Okay, and 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 you and you use the Cox model. So how did you put the time varying? Like its interactions with the time. What did you do? I'm just curious. Or it's or there's a, a model which can use time varying variables. It's a model that can use time variance. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I never used it myself. Interesting. Um, because um, for each person, we calculated pseudo observations at uh, different time points. So, um, like if you think of a data set, you have multiple rows per person. So, we just matched up what the value of the time variant covariate is at the time of the pseudo observation um, to analyze the time variant covariates. Very, very nice. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, so due to the time uh, limit, so maybe uh, let's move on to the to our next speaker, uh, and we can continue discussion afterwards. Um, so uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Ubi Chan, uh, who is currently a second year um, master student, and uh, she will join us again as a PhD student uh, in the fall. Uh, so. Ruby will talk about uh, exploring the association between multiple time-dependent biomarkers and time-to-death outcome for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. So, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. And thank you for Caroline's previous presentation. I think our research is actually somewhere related. So my topic is, uh, as Dr. Fan introduced, exploring the association between multiple time biomarkers and time to death outcome in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And it is part of the NYU Langone COVID-19 data challenge. And it is a collaborative work between our department division of biostats from NYU School of Medicine and also Department of Pathology from NYU Langone Health Hospital. So um, the COVID-19 we have uh, based on previous research, there is a bunch of important biomarkers associated with COVID-19 disease severity. Um, many of them are associated with uh, bleeding disorder or the predictive of need for mechanical ventilation. Um, 
we we found out like a dynamical observation of biomarkers can be more variable during the prognosis of COVID-19. And current COVID-19 research mainly studied the baseline biomarkers separately and the dynamic or we can call them time dependent biomarkers should be also considered simultaneously. So the simultaneous time, uh, biomarkers reflect disease progress for different aspects Effects and can have anti-gnostic effects on disease severity. So here's several statistical challenge for simultaneously evaluate these multiple time dependent biomarkers. First of all, there is potential high correlation among these biomarkers and there's intercorrelation for single biomarkers. And there's potential complex interaction among biomarkers and there's potential non-linear association between them as the mixture with the health outcome. So some traditional methods such as time-dependent Cox regression will be limited to address the above issues. And that's why uh, our group introduced this semi-parametric partial linear single index model, which can handle with these issues. So in this model, there's a non-parametric link function to cover the potential non-linearity and complex interaction. Also, the parametric coefficient will be used to explain the contribution of each biomarkers. And from here, I'm going to short for PRSI model. So PRSI model has been actively developed for various types of outcomes, such as continuous, binary, ordinal, longitudinal. And here we're looking at the survival outcome. So the aim of this study was, first of all, we're going to explore time to death outcomes, such as the time from the admission to the death or censored of the COVID-19 patients. Second is we're going to generate COVID-19 de-identified data, including these biomarker information with the outcome from the NYU Lincoln COVID-19 hospitalized patients. Third, we're going to explore the concurrent effects of each time dependent biomarker by standard time dependent Cox regression. Lastly, we want to explore the association between simultaneous multiple time dependent markers and time to death using PRSI models and uh, to assess the potential nonlinear joint effects and the relative contribution of each marker on survival risk. So here is the workflow of how we generated our data sets. So because of, it's part of this COVID-19 data challenge, where they are the de-identified COVID-19 data were stored on the server, uh, which is a Hadoop VDI platform, um, so-called the data lake. And there's four parts of data set. Uh, first of all, is the patient info. And then we identify those with positive uh, COVID tests past three days. And second is their encounter info and also their com comorbidity info, which is also the calcium um, score. And lastly, we use the component ID of each biomarker to identify their lab results. And then we merge all these part, four parts of data set together to generate our final big data set. And here is the, uh, for any one of you who have taken survival or are currently taking survival days, she looks pretty familiar. It's this is the univariate time dependent Cox regression model. And the beta here indicates the log has a ratio, uh, ratio and the model is adjusted for gender, race, comorbidity index. And so the limitations we mentioned before, the, uh, this kind of model assumes the covariance has linear effects. And when multiple markers are under study, this kind of model may suffer from multicollinearity and inefficiency due to the intercorrelation and complex interactions. And here is the formula for the PSI Cox model with time dependent covariates. Uh, this model were also adjusted for gender, age, race, and comorbidity. So here, the side portion. Uh, we use it to accommodate the potential nonlinear joint effects of the single index of these multiple biomarkers. And the beta here stands for the relative importance of each markers. And alpha is just like regular COGS proportional hazard model, you uh, indicates the log hazard ratio. So, um, and also the link function was approximated by a B spline technique. 
And there's some biomarkers would log transform due to the right skewedness of the data. And all the markers were normalized to have some same scale for model stability and interpretations. So for example, uh, PPC were excluded due to a lack of sample size and INR and HCD were excluded because they are very closely correlated to PD and hemoglobin. And after merging multiple biomarkers into one data set, uh, the missing data was imputed by last of observation carried forward because the number of observation were different among each markers. So here is just starting with some basic uh, descriptive statistics uh, of our data set. And we basically have two big groups of biomarkers. First of all is the cytokine-related biomarkers, and second is the hematology-related biomarkers. And each marker has a different um, observation numbers. And here, as we mentioned before, PTT was finally excluded from the data set because it has a lack of sample size. And the average of the observation per patient, uh, the number was evaluated by physicians to make sure they're making sense. That's why we included into our model. And here's the basic demographic information of our participants. And uh, not going to go into details here, but the total we have 4,991 patients and the desk group have 1,035 and non-desk group has 3,956. And here's the univariate time dependent Cox model for cytokine related mark after they're adjusted for age, gender, race, and comorbidity. So among these biomarkers, the IL-6 is not significant. And all the other ones are significant and has a hazard ratio larger than one, which indicates uh, the higher of these biomarkers, there's a higher risk of uh, getting uh, developing deaths for the patients. And here is the uh, model, univariate model for the hematology related markers. And PTT is not significant here. And the other ones, uh, the hemoglobin and platelet count has, uh, has a ratio less than one, which indicates the death um, higher of these biomarkers actually indicates a less risk of developing deaths for patients. And here's a uh, output of our PLSI Cox model after adjusted for the coverage I mentioned. And on the right-hand side, uh, the plot we're looking at is the joint effects of these biomarkers. As we can see here, uh, there's a nonlinear trend of these markers. And uh, when I say nonlinear, it's like, for example, the negative two to negative one comparing to one to two, uh, less one unit increment, but the increase of hazard ratio will be different because they are nonlinear with different uh, distance here. And uh, on the left hand side is the relative importance and uh, of each biomarkers. So when we're looking at the estimate uh, column here, uh, we can see the CRP, LDH, and L6 is significant in the model. And uh, among the CRP has the highest uh, relative importance comparing to the other biomarkers with a positive direction. And here's the output for hematology related markers. As I mentioned above, um, the right hand side shows this joint effects with the nonlinear association. And on the left hand side, when we look at here, uh, the WCB um, fat account and PT has are uh, significant in the model. And WCB has the highest coefficient, which indicates the highest relative importance among these hematology related biomarkers. So inclusion, uh, in biomedical studies, markers can change over time. And um, many studies related to COVID-19 are only focused on the association of baseline biomarkers with clinical outcome. And the relationship between markers and time to death for hospitalized COVID-19 patients has been less studied. And in this project, we explore the association of multiple time-dependent markers with time-to-death outcome using 
on the NYU Langone House COVID-19 de-identified data, and we assess the association of each marker using standard time dependent Cox regression. We also assess them using these PSI Cox model to identify possible nonlinear joint effects of these biomarkers, and to, we were able to delineate their relative contributions. So there is some limitation we cannot be avoid in the study. First of all, is the severity of, of hospitalized COVID-19 patients need to be considered. For example, the ICU status and ventilation status. So currently we're only adjusted for comorbidity index using Carlson score. Secondly is the there's a variance of clinical outcome of our interest, but here we're, we're only considering co, uh, mortality in this study. Uh, other than that, there's also length of hospitalization and mortality rate, etc. And uh, lastly, is in the de-identified data, patients may have long time gap between each hospitalized records. So, how to precisely I define the event time and centering time need further study, and we're still discussing about what's the right clinical cutoff value here. So lastly, I want to thank you for these uh, people. So Matt, Ian, Bing, Peng, they are the PhD student from Division of Biostaff from uh, OISO School of Medicine. And they proposed these wonderful projects uh, to look at the time dependent COVID-19 patients. And Dr. Lee and Dr. Wu are physicians from our Yulingan Health who provided us with a lot of insightful uh, suggestion for the biomarkers. And thank you. I would like to take any questions if there's time. Oh, great, thanks. Uh, I think for the interest of time, let's uh, first finish all the presentations and then we can uh, take questions at the end. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Olivia Dilao. Uh, so Olivia is uh, actually a first, as current uh, first year student uh, in our program. Uh, so she will talk about mortality among hospitalized native speakers and non-native speakers of, with COVID-19. Can you see my screen? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so yes, I'm Olivia Delau. I am a first year master's student at NYU GPH um, studying biostatistics. And I've been working with this uh, research project through Dr. Potensky's um, consulting lab. So I've been assisting uh, Dr. Chen Fu and Dr. Tariq Silk from NYU Lingual Medical Center in assessing COVID-19 mortality among native English speakers and non-native English speakers um, and hospitalized as a hospitalized patients. I've also been working alongside Janal Shah, who is also an alumni of our department. So a little bit of the background. Um, the purpose of this study is to understand the role of language among COVID-19 mortality. Um, there are a lack of studies that actually address language and COVID-19 outcomes, but there have been past studies that show that language has had an association with certain health outcomes, um, specifically looking at um, the influenza pandemic in 1918. So there was a 2016 Chicago study that showed for every 10% increase in illiteracy, there was a, actually a 32.2% increase in influenza mortality. And in the 2007 study by the Joint Commission, they found language barriers actually increased the risk of patient safety. So in the United States, there are about 5.4 million households that are lingu limit, have limited English proficiency. And in New York City alone, there are 3 million foreign born residents um, with about 1.8 million residents who are not English proficient. So we'd like to address um, if there are any um, associations between language barriers and uh, COVID-19 mortality. Um, so for our study design, we designed a retrospective cohort study. We identified all patients at New York University Langone Medical Center who are admitted as inpatients and who tested positive for COVID-19 between March 1st and May 15, 2020. We followed these patients from the time that they were tested positive for COVID-19 through the end of their hospital stay, whether that resulted in the earliest date of discharge or date of death. And we analyzed the data from September 2020 through December 2020. So for an individual to be included in the study, they must be over the age of 18 and they must have tested positive for COVID-19 between March 1st and May 15, 2020. 
And we extracted data from NYU Langle Medical Center's Integrated Electronic Health Record, EPIC, um, for all these patients that tested positive um, on def demographic data, comorbidity data, um, vital signs and laboratory measures, and um, covariates. So for our results, we extracted data from 4,186 uh, 4, patients who tested positive for COVID-19. And we finalized the sample size to 3,666 patients. Um, we had to exclude um, individuals who were missing information on uh, language, missing date of COVID-19 test, missing date of death, or missing information on primary language. So for our results, we first looked at the overall characteristics of our sample size and then of our sample study, and then we um, separated, we stratified by uh, language. So we have our English speakers and our non-native English speakers. I'm going to use the laser just to make it easier to see where I'm uh, talking about. So for our overall sample, we have um, a mean age of 62.60 years. We have a higher percentage of individuals who are males, a higher percentage of our white individuals. Um, high, we have a 35% of our um, population had uh, diabetes and 46% of our study sample had hypertension. Um, for our English speakers, um, as compared to our non-native English speakers, they had a higher percent of individuals who are white, um, individuals who had hypertension, who were morbidly obese, um, who were obese, and who were current and former smokers. And um, for our non-native English speakers, we had a higher percent as compared to our English uh, speakers of a race other, of individuals who were, had diabetes, um, who were of normal weight, um, who have never smoked, and who actually had a longer length of stay between um, eight to 174 days. Um, in this table, we wanted to look at the differences between hospitalized course variables um, based on our native, speaker, na native English speakers and our non-native English speakers. So we looked at our readmission rates, our mechanical ventilation, and our ICU ever rates. We didn't see any significant differences in the two groups um, between our readmission rates and our ICU ever rates. But for individuals who stayed a length of stay four to eight days, we did see there was a higher percentage of non-native uh, English speaking individuals who were mechanically ventilated as compared to our uh, native English speakers. Um, for this table, we also stratified by a survival status. So we can see that um, our English, non-native English speakers actually had a lower um, survival rate than our English speakers. Um, we also see that for individuals age 76 and higher, we have um, a lower survival rate. Um, individuals who were Black um, had a highest survival rate of all the races, and individuals who were Asian had the uh, lowest survival rate for all the coexisting conditions, including um, diabetes, hypertension, um, COPD, coronary artery disease, chronic kidney disease, um, any active cancer, um, individuals who are underweight, morbidly obese, and overweight. This um, resulted in a lower survival rate. And for individuals who actually were current and former smokers, they had a higher survival rate than individuals who were, have never smoked. Um, so then we wanted to look at um, the differences in survival between our non-native English speakers and our English speakers after uh, stratifying by length of stay and adjusting for different uh, variables. So we have four different models where we, our model one just adjusts, just adjusts for um, language only, and then model two adjusts for our demographic variables, model three adjusts for our demographic and clinical variables, and model four adjusts for demographic, clinical, and hospital course variables, including mechanical ventilation, ICU ever, and readmission. Um, so in our model one, where we adjust for language only, we do see that there is um, a higher odds of um, COVID-19 mortality among our non-native English speakers as compared to our English speakers. Um, and so for individuals who stayed a length of stay eight to 174 days, there was a 49% greater odds of COVID-19 mortality um, as compared to our English speakers. But once we adjusted for our demographic and um, clinical variables, we see that this, um, this difference in mortality gradually faded away. There was actually, um, for model four, we can see that there's um, a lower uh, odds of dying among our non-native non-native English speakers as compared to our English speakers. Um, but this model, these models are actually 
are not significant and do not show any significant differences between the groups. So in conclusion, in our unadjusted model, our non-native English speaking patients had a longer length of stay and a higher death rate as compared to our English speaking patients. But once we stratified by length of study and adjusted for our multiple demographic, clinical and um, hospitalized course variables, we see that the mortality, um, the difference in mortality gradually faded away. Some limitations are that non-native English speaking individuals are less likely to have access to health insurance insurance, which may lead to more at-home deaths that we're not able to observe in hospitalized patients. Um, and overall, so our overall sample does show that, um, that uh, non-native English speaking individuals do have an overall a lower survival, um, lower survival than our English speaking uh, individuals. And although this doesn't, um, this is not a significant difference between our hospitalized, uh, hospitalized treatment, there are um, still maybe social demographic factors and healthcare related disparities that, um, that uh, significantly have an impact on the different survival disparities between the groups that may need to be addressed. Um, and so these findings are similar to two 2020, study, two 2020 studies that address uh, racial differences and ethnic differences among COVID-19 outcomes for hospitalized patients. Um, so here are some acknowledgements, uh, and I'd like to thank you all for um, letting me speak today and citations, and um, I could save questions to the end, but yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Well done. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Sumed Kao. Um, so Sumed is an alumni of us, uh, so he got her, his uh, MS um, in 2020. Uh, he will talk about modeling and forecasting for COVID-19 spread in Miami-Dade County, Florida, USA, 2020. Um, thank you. I'll just share my screen. Sure. Go ahead. Can you see the screen? Yes. Oh, okay. very good. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Sumed, uh, graduated with Master of Science in Biostatistics from NYU School of Public Health in May 2020. So currently, I work as a biostatistician in the Department of Surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. And first of all, I would like to thank the Department of Biostatistics at NYU for organizing this symposium and giving me the opportunity to present my work. And so right after the graduation, I collaborated with Larkin Health System uh, to understand the disease transmission pattern by building a prediction model in Miami-Dade County. And it was in um, June 2020 when we started building it. And at that time, um, there was no county level prediction model developed. So our main goal was to spread, uh, spread awareness among the people in the county so that they become aware about the predicted cases and deaths uh, that could have happened in the county. So today I'm going to give a presentation on, the, uh, on modeling and forecasting for COVID-19 disease spread in Miami-Dade County in 2020. And we also published our paper in the Journal of Virology and Diseases. So please feel free to read it. And I would love to have comments and feedback on this paper. Um, coming to the background, uh, so I'll quickly go, through, uh, quickly go through first two bullet points because we know about this disease than any other disease. Uh, the only difference now is that we have a lot more of variants um, around the world, um, which have emerged in Europe, uh, United Kingdom, um, Brazil, South Africa, and they are spreading all across the world very quickly. Uh, so the significance related to this project uh, was that the researchers made several attempts to understand the transmission pattern of the disease by building forecasting models. And they were able to understand the dynamic changes in COVID-19. So the methodology is very similar to uh, what uh, Dr. Yang Feng uh, introduced in the very first presentation um, about the autoregressive coefficients uh, or terms uh, um, 
understanding the lag uh, terms using the ARIMA model, which is also called an autoregressive model. So I use the same methodology in this project. And also I use the Facebook's logistic growth model, which I'll be uh, talking about the mathematical equations in the coming slides. So in the literature, um, there are a lot of uh, publications which have used these methodologies. Uh, 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 some of them are uh, the, that the Fritela and colleagues, uh, they worked on the Indian data sets to forecast confirmed cumulative cases uh, for the uh, future 10 days. And uh, another publication was Wang and colleagues uh, who integrated the most updated COVID-19 epidemiological data uh, and they fit the cap of epidemic trend and then feed the cap value into the Facebook's profit model, uh, which is a machine learning based time series prediction model to derive the epidemic curve. And they uh, did the prediction at the global level, Brazil and countries like Brazil, Russia, India, Peru and Indonesia. And the next uh, 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 Literature was on ARIMA model, which is also called as uh, autoregressive integrated moving average model. So uh, a lot of literature is there, uh, and a few of them are by Duan and Sang, who predicted the daily new confirmed cases for a seven-day period uh, in Japan and South Korea. And the Haitian colleagues also predicted the cases in countries like Italy, Iran, Thailand, and Korea. So the gaps in the literature at that time when I started the project was that uh, there was limited research on COVID-19 forecasting models due to the paucity in the data collection. And there was research still going on to develop uh, different forecasting models. Um, in the United States, uh, we, uh, the University of Washington developed the uh, forecasting model and the forecasting is done on one to two month basis, but it is at the country level. So uh, we wanted to build uh, uh, our model at the county level uh, uh, because at that time there was no county level forecasting model. So, uh, and they, uh, the models that were built, they were predicting cases in that for a very short period of time. Uh, so the model that we uh, uh, proposed was doing long-term forecasting. And therefore we aim to build two to eight weeks of projections yeah. of cumulative cases and deaths and as well as new cases and deaths per day in Miami-Dade County. Uh, so the data for mapping projection graphs was used from the US counties data set, uh, which was uh, taken from the New York Times website. Uh, at that time, it was very difficult to get the county level data set as well, but fortunately uh, it was available uh, publicly on New York Times website. And the measures for this study was to predict the number of cumulative cases and deaths and new cases and deaths per day for the two to eight weeks on the basis of current cumulative cases and deaths and cases and deaths per day using Facebook's profit logistic growth model and autoregressive integrated moving average model. And we started uh, with the uh, predictions from confirmed cases and deaths from the beginning of pandemic from 11th March, 2020 to 30th June, 2020. And the forecasting was done till 25th August, 2020. And the models were updated on a weekly basis so that we can include more data points in order to bring more accuracy in the results. And all the statistical analysis were done in R version 3.6.3. And so I would like to start with the uh, mathematical theory of Facebook profit logistic growth model. Uh, so the idea of the algorithm is to select a suitable training model according to the characteristics of the historical data. And that data is used to predict the future observation results. So when forecasting growth, uh, there is usually some maximum achievable or saturation point, for example, total market size, total population size, et cetera. So we applied the same concept to COVID-19 uh, forecasting model in the real world. So in the uh, profit, the prediction model consists of these uh, terms, that is Y of T, uh, where G of T is a trend function, 
uh, which is used to analyze non-periodic changes of time series. And S of T is a periodic term reflecting the periodic change, such as the periodicity of a week or a year. And H of T is the influence of an occasional day or days, such as a holiday. So on holidays, we usually see uh, less cases in comparison to the other days. Uh, so it takes into account the holiday effect as well. And eta t is an error term on behalf of the field to consider the effect of the error of the model. So how it works in R, so the data frame used in profit needs two columns, uh, ds, which is used to store date time series, and the y column, which is used to store the corresponding values of the time series in the data frame. And ARIMA model, uh, so they are the most general class of models for forecasting in time series. Uh, so there are three parameters in the ARIMA models, which is called as PDQ. So P stands for uh, the lapse of the stationarized series in the forecasting equations, which are called as autoregressive terms. And D uh, parameter is a time series which needs to be difference to be made stationary which is also said to be an integrated version of a stationary series. And another parameter, uh, which is the Q parameter, which, is, uh, which takes into account the lags of forecast errors, which are called as moving average and a time series, which needs to be different to be stationary. And uh, the forecasting equation is constructed as follows. So if uh, let uh, first we let y denote d at difference of y, which means if d equals zero, y of t will be equal to capital Y of t. And uh, if d equals one, we take the subtraction of the previous term. And at d equals two, it is something different. So it is the first difference of the first difference. So what I mean, we take the discrete analog of the second derivative that is the uh, uh, local acceleration of the series rather than its local trend. So in terms of why the general forecasting equation is uh, this, where mu is the autoregressive coefficient, phi is the slope coefficient, theta are the moving uh, average parameters, and E is the error terms. So figure one, um, uh, so um, in, sorry. So in R, uh, how this works, ARIMA models, uh, we used to uh, achieve stationary on certain non-stationary time series. So how we achieved in R, we used the auto augmented Dicker fuller unit root test, uh, which is used to identify whether the time series is stationary. And in R, we used a T-series uh, and forecast package, uh, which were impl implemented and to produce the combining parsimonious par parameters models. And we also ran the correlogram of the ACF and PACF parameters. And we got the PDQ value corresponding as 0, 1, 1 in predicting cases per day and 1, 1, 1 for the PDQ respectively in predicting deaths per day. And automatically it, uh, we got the lowest PIC values of those models. So here is the figure one and two, which uh, gives the daily number of uh, new COVID-19 cases in the county. And figure two gives the uh, cumulative number of cases uh, in the county. And figure three is similar to figure one and two. We have the daily number of deaths and cumulative number of deaths in the county. So what we did, we uh, feed in the value of the uh, cumulative cases and deaths into the model for, in the pro, for, uh, Facebook's profit logistic growth model. And you can see that the black dotted lines are the actual cases. And the, what we predict is the blue line. You see that the, we have the similar trend what we predicted and the, in, in, with respect to the blue, uh, black dotted line. So these many cases were predicted uh, on August 25th, uh, 2020. And figure, uh, figure six represent the number of cumulative deaths. Uh, similar to figure five, we have the black dotted lines, which is the cumulative deaths, and blue line is what we predicted. So 2020 deaths were uh, predicted cumulatively by August 25th. 
and we ran the ARIMA model. Uh, so for ARIMA model, uh, it takes the average of the first wave and the second width wave. So that is why we see the bigger confidence interval at, uh, by, uh, on forecasting by 25th August, because it takes into account the bigger and the small waves. And similarly for daily number of COVID-19 deaths, uh, it takes an average of these previous historical data and predict the future data points. So our main findings for the profit logistic growth model uh, was that uh, these many cumulative number of cases and cumulative number of deaths were, predict uh, were predicted by August 25th, August. And the R squared value of these models was 0.99. And for the ARIMA model, uh, daily number of cases uh, were 1550 and 31 deaths. And AIC values were lowest for these models. So in conclusion, uh, what we actually, uh, what we predicted and they were similar in trend what uh, the actual number of cases and deaths were being uh, shown on the website at the Department of Health. So we're in similar in print till 11th August 2020. So we concluded that the models can be used given any historical data, but uh, on the limitations was that uh, it did not take into account the hospital records for those, the CED models, which Dr. Uh, Josh explained in the beginning of today's symposium, uh, those type of models can uh, be taken into account for forecasting, but the only limitation is that the, we cannot uh, have the hospital records publicly available. So it, it's a very difficult to build those kind of models. And for another limitation was that the model needs to be updated regularly. And in the future, uh, we can have more uh, better model performance measures like cross-validation measures and there are another methods like artificial intelligence methods uh, which was being uh, used by one of the scientists in Argentina. Um, so uh, those type of types of complex methodologies can better explain the forecasting of uh, cases and deaths in the, um, for the future. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Kinal Bhatt and Dr. Jack Michel, Dr. Makos at the Larkin Health System, uh, with whom I collaborated for this project and other faculty members at that organization. And of course, NYU faculties um, for their valuable knowledge that I gained through courses. Thank you. Great. Uh, great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so, Let's move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Jinao Shah. Uh, so Jinao was also a, uh, is also an alumni of us uh, who graduated in 2020 as well uh, in M for getting her MPH from us. Uh, so Jinao will talk about COVID-19 in individuals related to long-term hydrosocolorokin a propensity score matched analysis of uh, Sika 3 theo Loki Thea patient. So it's, uh, I couldn't even pronounce those uh, words. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Thank for the intro, uh, introduction. Um, and uh, okay, yeah, so as you said, um, I am a graduate of NYGPH. I graduated last year. Um, and today I'm presenting a project that I did last summer uh, with Dr. Batansky and a uh, few of the investigators from NYU Langon. Um, uh, and it's titled COVID-19 in Individuals Treated with Long-Term Hydrochloroquine, a propensity score match analysis of um, cicatricial alopecia patients. Um, to uh, give you a little bit of background, early in the pandemic, um, anti-malaria agent hydrochloroquine um, was really touted as a maybe potentially um, effective treatment for COVID-19 um, due to its an anti-inflammatory and antiviral effects. Um, but you might remember very soon the studies came out showing that it actually had my, um, no little to no impact on um, hospitalized patients who had mild or severe illness. Uh, so it really put its um, 
efficacy um, question as a post-exposure um, prophylaxis. Uh, when we were doing this study in summer, uh, there was a meta-analysis came out um, of five RCTs, uh, which showed that in a non-hospitalized patient, uh, total of 5,500 um, who were treated with either hydrochloroquine or placebo, um, that uh, actually it uh, found that uh, hydrochloroquine was associated with 24% reduction um, in COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, or death. Um, so what we were really interested in is looking at uh, to see if hydrochloroquine um, have any effect as a pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis um, in an outpatient settings. Um, so basically, if the patients have been on hydrochloroquine for a long time before they got exposed, does it have any uh, protective effect um, against uh, getting COVID-19 infection prior to the dependence? Um, and so this was a retrospective chart review. Um, uh, we looked at all the patients with cicatricial alopecia um, who were evaluated at MIU Langone uh, between January 1st, 2019 um, to May 1st, 2020. Um, so we chose this population specifically because um, cicatricial alopecia is um, kind of a hair loss condition with scarring. Um, uh, they are prescribed hydrochloroquine as one of the um, so we contacted the patients between June 5th, 2020 um, to July 1st, 2020 to see um, if they developed the COVID-19 uh, uh, during the initial wave of the pandemic in New York City. Um, so we defined that as between March 1st, May 15, 2020, um, and the COVID-19 um, had to be confirmed either by PCR or like antibody testing. Um, we did all our uh, analysis in R, um, and we started with descriptive statistics. So this, since this was an observational study, um, in order to minimize the non-randomized treatment um, assignment to the hydrochloroquine, uh, we used the propensity score method uh, with the inverse probability of treatment weighting with stabilized weights. Um, so what that estimates is the average treatment effect, uh, which um, estimates uh, uh, estimates the odds of having an outcome, so COVID-19, if all the individuals were given the treatment versus odds of having um, an outcome or COVID-19 if uh, entire population wasn't given um, hydrochloroquine. Um, and so since we had a small sample size and a lot of variable that could affect the prescription of hydrochloroquine, including uh, various subtypes of alopecia, we use um, a list absolute trinket selection operator or lasso um, to uh, retain the variable that were most predictive of hydrochloroquine prescription. Um, and so for the uh, main outcome analysis, we did the weighted logistic regression using the weights that we got um, from the propensity score model. Um, and in our final model uh, for the COVID-19 infection, in addition to hydrochloroquine use, we also had um, oral antibiotic use because of its subjective importance. Um, and uh, we used, uh, we added two other covariates, New York City residency and COVID-19 positive household contact, uh, mainly because we did not achieve a balance uh, for those two covariates um, after uh, our propensity score. Uh, rates. And um, so here is uh, some descriptive statistics. Um, so uh, we had total of 144 patients uh, with the mean age of 57. Uh, majority of our patients were female, uh, around 85.4%. Um, and 31.3% of our patients were on hydrochloroquine. Um, and the mean length of, um, of the therapy was 56.5% months. Um, and I just want to highlight that 37.7% of the patients were seen after March 1st via telehealth. Um, and we had a total of 12 of our patients that tested positive for COVID-19. So that's 8.33%. Um, um, and so yeah, so here's the results of the propensity score models. On the figure on the right, you can see the red triangle are the unweighted uh, standardized mean difference uh, and the blue uh, circles are after the weighting. 
Um, so you can see after the weighting, most of the standardized mean differences are within a 0.10, which is uh, the acceptable range in the literature, uh, except for household contact and New York City residency. So we have added them as a covariate, as I mentioned before, into our uh, final model. Um, and on the left hand side, um, the uh, actual model. model. Um, so uh, of, uh, uh, yeah, with interesting age, the odds of prescription uh, for hydrochloroquine um, decreased, uh, but with the DLE and LPP are specific types of um, uh, alopecia subtypes that uh, increase the odds of having uh, prescribed the hydrochloroquine as well as having an autoimmune disease. And so this is our final weighted logistic model. Um, as you can see, uh, plaquenil or hydrochloroquine was significantly associated with uh, 13 times lower odds of getting COVID-19 infection, as well as New York City residency uh, uh, was also associated with higher uh, odds of getting the infection, as you would expect. Um, and a use of oral antiandrogen and positive household contact uh, did not have any significant effect. And so uh, the strength of our study is that we had relatively healthy cohort. And by the, the time that we were looking, uh, we were doing this study, the other similar studies that attempted to look at the effect of chronic hydrochloroquine on COVID-19, only a minority of the, uh, uh, for those studies, they had majority of their patients were um, autoimmune disease, uh, uh, with autoimmune disease, whereas our patients were only 13% of them um, had autoimmune disease. Um, our study has limitations, of course. Uh, we, we do have a small sample size, um, and even though we try to adjust for non-randomization, um, that could still be a confounding bias due to unmeasured confounders. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, a uh, uh, majority of our cohort was female. Um, this was due to just the nature of the cicatricial alopecia that uh, most of patients are uh, female. And so in conclusion, this was one of the first analyses looking at um, hydrochloroquine as a potential PrEP treatment for COVID-19 infection. Mm -hmm. um, and the evidence suggests that it might have some benefits, but further uh, randomized control trials are needed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we finished this mm -hmm. analysis in late fall, um, mm -hmm. but we want to give an update that since then two RCTs have come out in actually just last month and April, that shows that within the healthcare professional, they uh, showed that um, hydrochloroquine uh, It had uh, no effective treatment as a PrEP uh, in reducing the uh, lab laboratory concern from COVID-19. And so with that, I just wanna uh, th uh, thank Dr. Batansky for giving us opportunity and um, helping throughout the analysis as well as our team yeah, at yeah, the um, Department of Dermatology, including Dr. Shu, Dr. Um, oh, Kitlin Lu, and these are my references and I'll save the questions to the last. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for the Great presentation. Uh, so next we have our uh, last but not the least uh, speaker of today, um, Yuan Zhao, uh, who is a PhD candidate in epidemiology. Um, so Yuan will talk about telemedicine and healthcare disparities during COVID. Uh, hello, everybody. So my name is Yuan. I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Epidemiology. Um, during the COVID, we did an interesting research about telemedicine healthcare disparity and used the data from uh, uh, OIU Longong Healthcare during the peak of COVID-19. And uh, we want to share with you um, some interesting findings from this research. So for the objective, um, as we see COVID during COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of hospitals have suspended their in-office visits. So telemedicine becomes a necessary entry point into the process of diagnosis, triage, and uh, treatment. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, previous study already reported disparity in infection and mortality for um, different racial and ethnicity groups. 
we want to also see if there's a digital divide during the uh, telemedicine access, especially racial and ethnicity disparities through the access of healthcare via telemedicine. Uh, so in the data collection process, we uh, the location for our data is uh, using NYU Langone Healthcare Electronic Medical Records. Um, it's a large academic hospital located in the New York City. They have pretty robust telemedicine capacities. Uh, they're providing 25 locations and uh, a big initiative of virtual urgent care. And the timeline we pick is from March 19, 2020, where they started a video for ambulatory visit to April 20, 30, 2020, um, where NYC, NYU hospital restarted the office visit. And this is also the peak of uh, New York City uh, COVID epidemic. So uh, the large population has access to uh, the care through telemedicine. And the population, we restricted all patients with the NYC home zip code, um, because as you can see, we will act, um, also assess some of the community level disparities. So to make sure the population is comparable, we only restricted to NYC patients. And this figure is showing you the process uh, of, and type of patients in the process. So there are three types of visits telemedicine, emergency department visits, and office visits. Uh, as you can see, compared to 2019, 2020 has a large increase of people access care through telemedicine uh, from 900 to more than 90,000 people. And uh, in all, when people, patient access the healthcare, they will be linked to providers and the providers will assess if they're likely to have a COVID. And then if they're, um, deemed likely they will have received COVID test. And if they receive COVID test in the NYU hospital, then we will have their uh, test outcome on file. And then that's also our main, one of our main outcomes. Uh, for measures, we collect two levels of variables. So uh, the first individual level of variables um, is collected from patient EHRs, demographic, social, and comorbidities. And for zip code levels, uh, collected from the public data source or American Community Survey. That's including the zip code level of population and ratio of women to men and percentage of different racial groups, uh, median household income and education attainment and household size. Um, that's the indicator of crowding. And the main outcomes, we have three main outcomes. Um, type of visit, if they're accessed through telemedicine or other types, and uh, if they have provided a diagnosis of COVID or positive COVID test result. Uh, for analysis, the descriptive statistic will first used to compare the uh, demographic and comorbidity differences between uh, each patient groups. And then we also did a multi-level logistic regression models with random intercepts because uh, we are incorporating some zip code level community um, variables in the model. Uh, so the descriptive uh, results, as you can see, um, I mentioned before, although the total visit has decreased in 2020 compared to the same period of 2019, uh, there's a large increase of people access care through telemedicine. Uh, and we also find that the mean age um, in the population assessment, access to uh, telemedicine has increased from 40 to 47, uh, meaning older people have access to care through telemedicine. And uh, there is also increased proportion of um, male in the 2020 population. And interestingly, uh, there is a larger population of black people on uh, access to care through telemedicine in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, and and subgroup analysis has indicated it's mostly driven by younger and female population. So here's showing you a map of the change of number of patient access telemedicine compared to 2019 to 2020. Uh, interestingly, you can see a large increase of the zip code are located in um, either downtown Manhattan and Brooklyn area. But that also could, in um, because uh, NYU patients are mostly located in those areas. Uh, for the uh, 
logistic regression results, uh, we we see that black patients are more likely, um, as I highlighted here, they're more likely to test positive for COVID and uh, less likely to access telemedicine compared to white patients. And uh, uh, also for female patients, they're more likely to access telemedicine compared to men and less likely to be tested positive for COVID. Uh, we also find interesting result in compared, to, uh, compared to the primary language. As uh, you can see, if they report a primary language as Spanish, they're less likely to access telemedicine and more likely to be tested positive. In the community level, um, we see that there are two main variables that are significant. One is median household income and uh, community higher um, community level household income is associated with increased telemedicine use and decreased likelihood of tested positive for COVID. And uh, another uh, variable is medium household size. And um, as you can see, it's less likely, they are less likely to access telemedicine and more likely to be tested positive for COVID. Uh, so just to repeat again, two main takeaways. Um, on the individual level, black patients uh, have increased uh, access for telemedicine than the prior uh, 2019. But however, compared to white patients, they're still utilizing at the lower level and might maybe sicker when access care as indicated, they're more likely to be test positive for COVID. And at the community level, higher medium income is associated with decreased uh, um, a positive COVID test and uh, higher likelihood to access telemedicine. And the medium uh, household size is with associated with increase of a positive COVID and uh, less likely to use telemedicine. So then there are uh, some implications for designing the future telemedicine infrastructure. So for example, on the te technical side that uh, we need to design a uh, telemedicine system through the development of cultural and structurally appropriate tools and technology. And as it is showing there's disparity of accessing telemedicine, it's very important to make sure that this um, system is uh, uh, cultural and uh, racial friendly for people in the vulnerable groups. Um, that could also improve um, the diversity of uh, telemedicine providers in some of the minority groups and uh, provide more um, user-friendly language access. Uh, another thing is we find that certain um, structural factors will um, increase, uh, will affect the access to the telemedicine. Therefore, it's important to do some outreach in the community and uh, um, try to decrease the barrier to care through telemedicine in um, some of the vulnerable communities. Uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rumi Chanara for leading this uh, effort. And uh, it's a truly collaborative effort um, from uh, School of Medicine, School of Engineering. And uh, we had some interesting results. I um, think that's all. Thanks. I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Uh, thank you. And thanks, thanks to all the uh, speakers in the second half. Um, so now, uh, yeah, because uh, yeah, we are a bit over time, but still, uh, so if you have any questions to any of our speakers, please feel free to ask this moment. Um, I'll just uh, jump in and say thank you to everyone. I, I think everyone did a really great job uh, with fantastic talks and uh, really very good work on these important projects. So thank you all and thanks for participating. So I, I'll ask a question to Yuan. Uh, so I saw in your analysis, there is a, a random effect term, right? I, are you mm -hmm. using a random effect? Um, so what kind of random effect model? Um, like, can you explain a little bit about that part? Um, uh, so, yeah, so we did a, a multi-level multi logistic uh, regression. The random effect is random intercept. So we also tried a random slope, but it doesn't really show any differences. So we just did a random intercept for um, I see. So, uh, 
Great, thanks. Do you have uh, also, um, do you evaluate it in like, say it's, uh, for example, uh, out of sample prediction performance for the model? Uh, out of sample prediction? Like a prediction, like test how it, uh, because now it's like a, you fit a model, right? Using the data and how about, uh, is it, does it have a good prediction power for the, for example, you held out, do you try to held out some data and then see how it predict? Um, uh, yeah, we didn't do that, but I think R square is around 0.8-ish, so, uh, but we didn't do an uh, auto sample test. That, that's a good point. Right, because that's on the training data, right? So maybe it's interesting to see how it behaves like for a new, for some new data set. Yeah, but yeah, very interesting. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I have one question. Uh, Go ahead, Aris. Uh, for SUMED, uh, the predictive model. Um, so this uh, autoregressive model. So what is the time horizon that you were interested in? And what is the time horizon that you think the model is good enough? It's a one week, two weeks, less than two weeks. Just curious to know how good it is in forecasting. So we started with the let's say from the beginning of pandemic till 30th June, and we were predicting up till 25th August. So initially till 30th June, then we started updating on a weekly basis, let's say on then second update on 6th, 7th July, then 14th July. So we looked at the R squared value of all those models uh, and they were pretty high around 0.99 only. So we concluded that it was the model R squared value or performance was similar in trend, like it was similar for short term as well as long term forecasting. Did you try to validate it in a way that you, you can take the past in the future and see how it's uh, forecasting, like, you know what I mean? Like taking the, take, taking the interval of the past, pre predicting, comparing, again, predicting, comparing, how good it is in predicting the, in the end. Yeah, so we didn't do the actual internal validation or uh, cross validation technique. So that's what I recommended in the conclusion that those performance measures would be uh, good enough to validate the model. Uh, but it's a good idea that we can choose the different date points. Let's say start date can be different or end date can be different. Um, because I did this project right after the graduation and I wasn't aware so much about the validation or ex validation. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, so I just thought of updating the model on a weekly basis and see how well the model R squared is taken out. Yeah, yeah it's a good approach. Absolutely. Okay, um, any other questions, comments? Okay, so um, I would thank thank all the speakers and uh, everyone to be so patient and interested in this symposium. And um, so let's um, stop here, I guess. Uh, so I uh, wish everyone um, healthy and um, enjoy the weekend. Um, I hope to see everyone in person uh, when this uh, epidemic ends. Okay. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.